Okay, so I'm going to be the panel moderator for our last session before our keynote you know, presentation. Um, and so I have the honor to introduce our first presenter as part of this panel, uh, Richard Rice. Richard Rice received his PhD from the University of Chicago in, 19, in 1974 and joined the Richard W. of Loma Linda University at La Sierra the same year. His wife, Gail, was the director of the faculty development at La Sierra University for or Loma Linda University for many years. They both retired in 2020. They have two children and five grandchildren. Rice wrote, Rice wrote his first book entitled The Openness of God in 1980 and contributed to a second book to bear the same title in 1994. InterVarsity Press published his latest book, The Future of Open Theism, from Antecedents to Opportunities in 2020. His other books include Reign of God, Introduction to SDA Theology, Reason, and the Consciousness, Believing, Behaving, Belonging, Finding New Love for the Church, and finally, Suffering and the Search for Meaning. So it's my honor to introduce uh, Richard. Thank well, thank you very much. It's certainly a pleasure to be here and uh, to hear these wonderful papers, and then to think that uh, when I went to graduate school, the people delivering these papers weren't even born. So <laughs> I um, want to talk about a figure that uh, I really enjoyed reading in graduate school. Um, my first year was uh, rather intimidating, <coughs> studying with scholars like David Tracy, Schubert Ogden, and others. But then I took a course in Reinhold Niebuhr, and I could actually understand what he was saying. And that made that a, a somewhat unusual class. So <clears throat> I'll also mention that one of the uh, interesting things about reading Niebuhr in Chicago was that some of the things he was talking about uh, were illustrated by the uh, Chicago machine operated primarily by Richard J. Daly, who had a tremendous influence on uh, uh, the Democratic Party in Chicago, the way things ran in Chicago, and um, uh, possibly the outcome of the presidential election just a couple of years before. 1968. We don't know for sure. So it was, it was interesting. Um, <clears throat> um, going from California to Chicago was an interesting experience for a variety of reasons. Um, I got stopped in Chicago once for running a red light, <clears throat> and the police officer asked me for my license. I gave it to him. He says, you don't have a local license. I said, no, I'm a student here from California. I had a California license. He said, do you have a bonding card? I said, uh, no, what's that? He said, well, that's something your insurance company provides you in case you get stopped, you can offer that instead of your license. And uh, he said, now, if you don't have either one of those, typically we take you to the police station and you have to post bond. So I opened my wallet, which was absolutely empty. And he said, well, okay, just be more careful next time. <laughs> So I went back to, when I got back to our apartment, I called the insurance agent. I don't think I'll give you the name. <laughs> I said, Frank, um, what's a bonding card? I got stopped. He says, oh, no, if you get stopped, just keep a $5 bill <coughs> folded up under your license. And when you hand that to the police officer, he'll take the money and let you go on your way. <clears throat> I'd never heard of that before. <laughs> I said, are you sure? He says, oh, yeah, they all do that <laughs> here in Chicago. So, that was part of my experience. Well, anyway, um, another revelatory experience was my chance to read Reinhold Lieber. So I'm going to read right through this and try to get through the material. And um, it has some footnotes, but uh, I'll try to resist the temptation to read through that. Sin is sometimes described as the only Christian doctrine for which there is abundant empirical evidence. Whether that's an exaggeration or not, the concept provides a perspective 
on human behavior, notable for both its complexity and its practical applicability. And no theologian in the last century explored these two facets of sin more extensively than Reinhold Niebuhr. His theological account of human nature and his astute analysis of the human condition proved to be stunningly accurate time and again. Growing up in Illinois, the son of a German immigrant, Niebuhr did not speak English fluently until he went to college. <clears throat> After attending Eden Theological Seminary and Yale Divinity School, he served as parish pastor in Detroit for 13 years and in 1928 joined the faculty of the Union Theological <laughs> Seminary. The author of 17 books and hundreds of articles, Niebuhr has been described as one of the leading public intellectuals in America and clearly the most significant theological voice in the land. Many have commented on the role Niebuhr played as a public intellectual active during the worldwide political upheavals of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. At a 66 banquet in his honor, then the US Vice President Hubert Humphrey described Niebuhr as one of the world's most profound political philosophers, scholars, theologians, and prophets. No preacher or teacher, at least in my time, has had a greater impact on the secular world. No American has made a greater contribution to political wisdom and moral responsibility. <clears throat> According to David Tracy, Niebuhr's theology was a unique blend of two traditions, classical Protestant liberalism, which reinterprets Christian doctrines in relation to modernity, and neo-orthodoxy inspired by Karl Barth, which challenges modern innocence about the adequacy of enlightenment reason to solve our problems. In this daring and original enterprise, Tracy continues, Niebuhr rethought one of the most unlikely symbols in the Christian tradition, original sin, which portrays the human predicament as a tangled combination of free will and the conflict that it engenders. <clears throat> Niebuhr's concept of sin lies at the center of his best known work, The Nature and Destiny of Man, based on his Gifford lectures of 1939, and a year before. In the opening paragraphs of this classic work, Niebuhr identifies four, uh, identifies human virtue as one of the four paradoxes of human self-knowledge. If we regard human beings as essentially good and attribute the presence of evil to social and historical causes, he argues, we find that historical and social evidences of evil are themselves the consequence of evil in humanity. On the other hand, if we regard ourselves as essentially evil, the question arises as to the standpoint from which we could make such a judgment. How can we be essentially evil if we're capable of judging ourselves to be so? This implies a viewpoint that transcends both good and evil. Now, as Niebuhr interprets it, the biblically derived concept of sin captures the complexity of this essential paradox. Sin means that human evil is not the direct consequence of our involvement in nature, not finiteness itself, but the attempt to deny the limits of our finiteness and dependence. Though not strictly necessary, sin is nevertheless inevitable. Because we are both finite and free, we are inherently anxious and therefore subject to temptation. In this light, human sin is neither an act of sheer perversity nor an inevitable consequence of freedom and finiteness. Instead, it results from a misinterpretation of our situation. Sin thus contains elements of both ignorance and insecurity, and we can see both in the various forms of pride. The pride of power involves ignorance of one's limitations on the one hand and insecurity regarding these limitations on the other. It may take form in the will to power or greed in striving to overcome its insecurity. Pride of knowledge involves the same two elements and is therefore both a result of ignorance of one's ignorance and an attempt to obscure one's ignorance by claiming finality of knowledge. Pride of virtue involves establishing one's own goodness as final righteousness and one's relative norms as absolute. When moral pride is transformed into spiritual pride, the prophetic instrument designed to check pride becomes instead an instrument on pride's behalf. Sin thus arises from an inherent tendency to secure our own interests at any cost. 
And the problem is not just the way we do things, it's the way we see things. Sin makes it virtually impossible for us to perceive our own needs and the needs of others with equal clarity. So when we pursue our own interests at the expense of others, it seems like the perfectly logical thing to do. And if called on to explain ourselves, we are good at finding arguments to justify our actions. As Langdon Gilkey puts it, people consistently deny the motivations that equally consistently determine their conduct. We seek to serve ourselves in ways that give the appearance of serving some higher purpose, and we rely on our rational faculties to help us do this. Um, I think a wonderful application of Niebuhr's insights can be found in Langdon Yoki's book, Shantan Compound, when he made his way uh, as one of, as chair of the housing committee to different people uh, in a camp where people largely of European origin during the Second World War were interned in a camp on the Chinese mainland under the jurisdiction of the Japanese and uh, how they had to arrange their lives, decide who lived in what quarters and who pursued what jobs and so on. Uh, if you read that, you get a, a very uh, vivid application of the insights that Niebuhr had. <clears throat> According to Niebuhr, what is true of us as individuals is even more characteristic of human collectives or groups. How much time? 10. Groups also instinctively prioritize their own interests, but the selfishness of groups has different qualities. For one thing, it's less obvious since it involves a number of people, sometimes many, so it is more easy to rationalize and more difficult to counteract. In fact, the larger institutions become, Niebuhr argues, the easier it is to make their extravagant claims seem plausible. They can shroud self-interest with the garb of country, honor, and glory in ways that mere individuals never could. Not only are human institutions capable of greater pretension than individuals, they obviously have superior power. And as the title of one of his books, Moral Man and Immoral Society suggests, they also lack some of the moral resources that individuals have. Consequently, there's a fundamental distinction between the morality of individuals and the groups. Because individuals have moral resources that are not available to groups, they are capable of higher moral attainments. On a personal level, people sometimes transcend their partial perspectives and perceive the true worth of other human beings. On rare occasions, individuals may even sacrifice their own interests in order to benefit others. But if such achievements are difficult for individuals, Niebuhr insists, they're impossible for groups. Human collectives, whether families, races, classes, nations, <clears throat> or churches, are notoriously incapable of self-criticism. So when a group senses a threat to its security, it inevitably moves to protect itself. Indeed, every collective instinctively prioritizes its own interests. And those who argue in favor of institutional or collective privilege can be resourceful in finding justification for their preferences. Due to the self-centered nature of a group's perspective, appeals to standards or ideals as a means of countering the injustice a person or a minority experiences will not be effective. The only effective response will be to invoke the self-interest of the larger community in some way. This is why for Niebuhr, the way to achieve a rough, a rough approximation of justice or equality is to grant people in all segments of a society the capacity to act in their own interest. And this is why if one finds oneself unjustly treated by an institution or social entity, the only effective course of action is somehow to appeal to the self-interest of the larger entity. This typically involves a demonstration that granting the demands of a minority will also serve the interests of the larger community in some way. The inevitability of self-interest thus plays an important role in Niebuhr's ethics since vast disproportions of power are inherently unjust 
A distribution of power is essential to the achievement of justice. Why? Not because it actualizes the ideal of human equality, but it because it gives everyone, or at least a wide variety of individuals, the opportunity to act in their own interest. Thus, Niebuhr puts it, the human capacity for justice makes democracy possible. The human inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. The simplest illustration of this, if you look at the footnote, one personal story that my grandmother gave me about her mother was uh, what she did when uh, two children wanted the same piece of pie. To ensure the portions would be evenly divided, she would ask one of them to cut the piece in two and then let the other child choose which half he or she wanted. And that guarantee an absolutely precise division <laughs> to two equal parts. <clears throat> Self-interest promotes equality. So even though people on an individual level may respond to appeals to charity or generosity, the only viable way to affect a change in group or corporate behavior is show that it serves the interests of the group to do so. And the only way to make this possible is to grant minorities within the larger community the power to express and pursue their own interests. <clears throat> For Niebuhr then, there's an essential connection between power and justice. For a society to be just, to achieve an approximation of justice, there must be a distribution of power among its members. Reason alone is not enough to counteract personal interests. Since reason is always to some degree the servant of interest in a social situation, social injustice cannot be resolved by moral and rational suasion alone. Conflict is inevitable, and in this conflict, power must be challenged by power. The selfishness of human communities must be regarded as an inevitability. It can be checked only by competing assertions of interest and these can be effective only if coercive methods are added to moral and rational persuasion. As these comments suggest, I've been most impressed with Uber's <clears throat> insights into the complexities of human behavior, particularly the various and varied ways in which sin manifests itself in our experience. His anthropology provides a large scale argument for the value of religion and understanding human experience and the particular value of certain religious concepts. He demonstrates that some of the central contents of Christian faith make sense of vast ranges of human experience, not only in its disturbing and harmful dimensions, but also in its possibilities. His anthropology also provides a solid basis for Christian ethics with its appreciation for both idealism and realism. How much time left? Two, oh, three minutes. Okay, I'm going as fast as I can. Niebuhr's extensive application of Christian concepts to aspects of human social behavior provides a corrective to unwarranted individualism in our understanding of religious commitment. Within conservative Protestantism, at least the Protestantism in which I was raised, sin is typically understood in, in personal terms something of which we as individuals are guilty, and salvation is the divine response to this problem. It consists of absolving individuals of guilt and restoring their personal relationship to God. <clears throat> Hence the familiar emphasis on baptism as the expression of an individual, indeed private decision, to accept God's forgiveness and surrender to the leading of the Spirit in one's life. Accordingly, the church consists of a voluntary society of those who have individually accepted God's offer of salvation and committed themselves to an ongoing personal relationship with God that results in growth in character and service to others. While accepting the view that sin is manifested in the life of every individual, I particularly appreciate Niebuhr's insights into the social dimensions of sin. From his perspective, human groups of whatever sort exhibit an instinctive commitment to their own survival and success. And the essential self-serving nature of this commitment is often difficult for people to perceive because the value and importance of the group obviously transcends that of the individuals that exist. As a result, 
People who act or are convinced that they are acting on behalf of a larger community will instinctively relegate the interests of a minority to a status of lesser importance and award them diminished value. Now, impressive as they are, Niebuhr's proposals have been subjected to a number of criticisms, and you can look at them there. <laughs> <laughs> I found it interesting, however, and I'll have to be abbreviated here, that um, his views were appropriated uh, by and approved of by some prominent African American uh, figures like Martin Luther King Jr. and Barack Obama. In one of the papers he wrote at Boston University, King described Niebuhr's thought as a necessary corrective of a kind of liberalism that too easily capitulated to modern culture. And uh, in an inter offsite interview with New York Times columnist David Brooks, Senator Barack Obama, then Senator, spoke of his admiration for Niebuhr, whom he described as one of his favorite philosophers, and attributed to him the compelling idea that while there's serious evil in the world and hardship and pain, we should be humble and modest in our belief that we can eliminate those things but we shouldn't use that as an excuse for cynicism and inaction. We have to make these efforts knowing they're hard and not swinging from naive idealism to bitter realism. Still, whatever the shortcomings or inadequacies of his work, Niebuhr's vivid ethical convictions, his penetrating social insights, and his arresting expressions continue to awaken admiration. <clears throat> and stimulate discussion. Because the moral resources of individuals and groups are so different, Niebuhr maintains that certain virtues lie beyond our corporate life. In particular, we cannot expect to find love and its highest expression forgiveness in the social arena. But this is not to say they have no social value. Ideals can inspire us even though they elude empirical, collaborative, politically, political form. Two more short paragraphs. Niebuhr's views have been subjected to numerous criticisms, but his central insights into the morality of groups have enduring significance. Even those of us who are closely related to a religious group. Though he characteristically devotes most of his attention to the complexities of human existence and the limited applicability of Christian ideals, he nevertheless affirms their value occasionally in ways that are politically, poetically moving. Consider the combination of conceptual complexity and eloquent phrasing in this send up of the great Pauline triad of faith, hope, and love. This always chokes me up a little. Nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. No virtuous act is quite as virtuous from the standpoint of our friend or foe as it is from our standpoint. Therefore, we must be saved by the final form of love which is forgiveness. Thank you. Uh, we want to make sure that all the presenters have equal and fair time to present. We started a little bit late after lunch, so we're going to move just to 10 minutes of uh, Q&A, okay? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, addressing this issue of the sin of institutions. And uh, it's, yeah, this is happening, you know, the greed of power. And I was looking a little bit, uh, and it says it detaches us from emotion, sentiments, feelings. And this is why they give lower, lower salary to keep more for, for themselves. So, so this is capitalism. And I found another term, it's art bureaucracy. I don't know if I pronounce it correctly. It's not so common, art bureaucracy which means political system where power is based on the wealthiest elements of the society. Uh, so this is happening in the political system in the United States. 
but how do we see this happening in the in the Adventist church? Mm. Is it sin? <laughs> Is it sin as a sin? Well, how, how can we combat this? Because we are individuals. You said power uh, needs to be challenged by power. So there is a need for a movement in the Adventist church to combat this? Well, I, I think there need to be ways of trying to show the particularity and the preference of those who are in power. And sometimes that involves an exercise of power in the other direction. That's the, the, the to be Niburian here, you'd have to say the only way to challenge an overwhelming manifestation of power is to somehow develop power in response to that. And that's why he approves of democracy. And I think what, what could be done within the church is to develop enough sentiment for a minority position that it cannot be ignored and the other would be in, in some way to appeal well, here's what you do appeal to the self-interest of the organization to say this will benefit the ultimate the the overall organization in one way there's a personal incident that i didn't put in the paper because i thought it might make its way out but um, the policy, <laughs> the policy of, uh, uh, of Adventist institutions was to give uh, faculty members a certain degree of uh, credit toward their, uh, or benefit toward their children's uh, tuition. And uh, the policy was to apply that, uh, whatever that benefit amount was, to whatever the expense a child might have going to a, uh, one of our campuses overseas. Well, there was one school in particular that was facing some financial challenges. And so the response was, we'll give you the percentage of the tuition that institution is charging that you'll get here. Well, people who looked at that realized that will limit our resources so much that we can't afford to send our children overseas. And therefore, they'll have to go to school here at home. And the money that you've originally promised will have to go to them anyway. So you're not really saving the school any money. You're just telling some kids they can't go and benefit from the policy that uh, they should. All it is. It was politics then. It was saying, look, you're not going to gain what you hope to by this policy. You're actually going to lose something. And so it was a manifestation when some parents objected to that and used that as a, a rationale for it, a way of responding. So I think in a way that has, uh, I mean, that, that's a, you know, that's a trivial illustration in a sense, but I think that has to that has to be taken into account. And of course, it, it is a challenge to work for an institution whose objectives are described in the most glorious terms we can imagine. <laughs> and uh, find that a policy needs to be revised in a way that meets standards, um, supposedly, that the institution is dedicated to. So it, it, but it takes a challenge, and I think the, the value of democracy, as, uh, as Niebuhr points out, is not that it assumes that everybody is perfectly fair, but that it gives everybody enough power to have some kind of influence on the outcome of the uh, decisions that the institution makes. So you need to give them a voice. You need to give them a voice, and sometimes the only way to get a voice is to shout loudly enough. Okay, I'm just, I'm just going to cut you off here so we can have maybe um, one or two very pointed, direct questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, Niebuhr is great uh, with his work. I learned from you and others, and it got me a long way back. But I've always felt that one can write an equally interesting book on moral, uh, moral institutions and immoral man 
because I hang out in an education which tries to shape people. So can you speak to this aspect of institutions promoting moral good upon individuals? Well, I think many institutions are dedicated to that. Uh, and I mean, constitutionally, institutionally, and uh, ideally. I think what Niebuhr is talking about is the way that people concretely behave and often behave by appealing to what the institution stands for. So the, the um, what would we say, the objective or the, the ideal uh, pursuit of the institution uh, may still be there, and yet individuals in the name of what's there will um, uh, may do things that aren't entirely fair. And I think this is uh, so the great shame time behind that. It's what Gilkey found people were doing in the interest of making things best for their children. They were really depriving other families of room that they had to have for theirs, and they couldn't, uh, they really couldn't see with equal vividness the needs of others to their own needs. So the commandeer, the institution, yes, they're individuals who are immoral that are commandeering the social institution. So this has always been a tension for me. Is it an individual commandeering a good social institution or is the social institution the bad thing? And that's always been a tension for me. Well, I think, I think institutions can express their objectives in high sounding uh, and inspirational ideals. But when you look at the way people actually yeah. behave, there will be uh, ways of appealing to those objectives sure. to benefit themselves. Uh, and yeah. so we've, we've, we've had some real challenges in trying to be uh, an institution, in trying institutionally, yeah. not just to affirm the value of every member of the institution, but to actually provide ways for every member of the institution to have an influence, a perceptible influence on what the institution decides. I think that's what I think that's what uh, Niebuhr is getting at. Um, we're too easily, what would you say, maybe distracted by the ideals that we assume we are pursuing and uh, in, installing to. Uh, <laughs> Um, be able to see that we're actually serving ourselves in some ways as we supposedly are pursuing those objectives. This is a downer of a talk. <laughs> <laughs> I got to find a high note here to end up. Uh, I think we have to move on to our next panelist just so everyone has to keep His hand was up before I was. Uh, if it's short. <laughs> Go ahead, Jen. I want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I uh, no so much pressure to drug. Right. So, Dr. Rice, thank you so much for your presentation. One of the things that I've wondered about is uh, Nietzsche famously said that philosophy is, is a form of involuntary autobiography, right? And I wonder in this case whether or not uh, Niebuhr's sociology is a form of auto sociology in, in terms of him capturing uh, in, in his descriptive way a moment in history, and then he then turns it into a metaphysics of what it must be in terms of social institutions. Because one example that I can give is that uh, Eugene McCarrick is a story talking about the transition from the medieval moral economy into sort of early nascent capitalism. It actually took pretty concerted uh, institutional effort on the part of pol pol political leaders and the elites to completely deconstruct and destroy the ties that human beings have to each other in terms of caring about each other, economic well-being, and so on. And then we entered into a neoliberal age, we tend to frame the situation as individuals competing with each other. Now, there are many sociological experiments that uh, kind of shows that if you frame a situation a certain way, you also frame their expectations. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, you frame how they behave in those institutions, right? So I wonder if, if, if we embrace Niebuhr's analysis, perhaps pessimistic analysis of the possibilities of group solidarity. Are we then not embracing a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy? Let me think about that. <laughs> <laughs> Very well formulated. <laughs> I knew it wasn't going to be short. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's one nice thing about Niebuhr, I think.
thinkers, he, he recognized the potential limitations of his own position. Uh, and uh, I remember one, one, one story about it was that he was talking about Billy Graham and his popularity. And uh, he had differences of opinion. But at the end, I think he said something to the effect of, well, he's Billy Graham and I'm only going to leave him. So he really had to, I think he had an ability to appreciate the, the value of others and the possible limitations of his own view and apply uh, the critical capacity he shows so to, uh, eloquently to others to his own position as well. Appreciate that. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Thank you.